first and foremost thing is freedom and time. So um, the best way I put this is there are so many good bakers out there, but very few of them know how to run a bakery. Two Second Lean is a framework that runs your bakery for you. Hello, and welcome to the Growth Circle Podcast. I'm your host, Lincoln Amstutz, and today we've got a good friend of the podcast on, Hugh Carnahan. Uh, excited to have him here and just jump into uh, some current uh, things that he's working on, the market update, and just diving in a little bit deeper with him on this episode. Uh, he came on episodes 43, 26, 22 uh, with Jake, um, our previous host, and Phenomenal time there. Uh, I actually was listening back through those and, and learned a lot even uh, just in preparation for this. So excited to have him on. He doesn't need any introduction, but I'll make one anyways here. Uh, he is known as the Hillbilly Millionaire, and he started his business journey in man the manufacturing industry before eventually transitioning his skills into real estate. He has found massive success in his own efforts to improve his skills and business and now helps others on their paths to achieve their goals. So without any further ado, Hugh, welcome back to the Growth Circle Podcast, man. Hey, thanks for uh, having me back on. Uh, I'm really excited. And this is uh, you know, the first interview um, since you've been the host. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited. And uh, your intro sounds great. Uh, sounds a little too <laughs> fancy for me, but um, but yeah, we'll, hey, we'll make hey, do with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. We'll get jumping in here and uh, should be a good convo. I'm um, just catching up. So uh, basically, like I said, you've been on here. A lot of people are going to know of you, your content, but, uh, for those of the, for those of the listeners that have not had the chance to get acquainted with you, could you give us an overview and kind of rundown of where you're from, what got you into business and real estate, and really even take us to, uh, what you're doing today, kind of what your focus is at the current time. Sure, absolutely. I can do a really quick intro. So I'm I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Missouri, uh, and I grew up in a military school. Decided do I want to go in the military or not? Decided, hey, as an 18 year old, probably shouldn't make this decision. Uh, so I went to Texas A&M instead of going directly to West Point, Point. Um, and then that gave me another two years to decide. Uh, ultimately, decided I did not want to join the military because I've been doing the thing since I was 10. And then I went into the private sector as an IT guy. Um, working for Fortune 500 companies. I worked for oil companies doing their IT. Then I went to business to business. So I was always around systems and processes. And then in 2014, my father passed away and there's a family business in manufacturing. So I kind of left uh, and then moved back home to Missouri and uh, joined up the, the manufacturing company. Uh, at that point, my father had passed away a few years before. The company was kind of aimlessly drifting and I started Googling how to save failing company, how to save you know, failing company. Uh, and I came across something called Two Second Lean and, um, and, and then Lean in Manufacturing is supposed to be this big, scary thing, which, you know, you never heard of it. It's basically the science of efficiency at, from a business standpoint. And, uh, and I came across a guy that was like, oh, Lean is simple. And it was an hour and 30 minutes. And that was my first pivot of my life into just being really, really good at systems and processes. Ended up saving the China branch of that company. And then uh, right around COVID, I broke free um, and was kind of tasked with, hey, you know, we should get some additional revenue streams um, going. And so I was already doing that for me. <clears throat> I didn't know anything about, you know, bigger pockets, uh, at the time started crushing some real estate content, uh, from a user and then, uh, ended up making my first purchase, bought 26 crack houses, started flipping back then moved on to buy commercial real estate. Um, you know, bought a missile silo, which is a blast, uh, last two to three years since then, we've been very calmly just stabilizing what we've had and, you know, buying nearly term key properties because we can now because of the market. Uh, commands it. So it's a very high level overview. Uh, but the reason I was able to scale so quickly was because of absolutely because of my manufacturing background in two second lean. So very nice. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating story. Everybody should go and listen to kind of the, the full breakdown of yeah how you've gotten here. Because yeah, that manufacturing experience definitely played a role in getting into real estate and just kind of crushing it from the start and, and going very quickly. Uh, does does business 
like kind of like a business mindset, self starter, problem solving uh, solutions. Does does that come somewhat naturally to you? Is that you know your your leaning, or is it very much just a learned skill of discipline of research that you've just grown over time? I think uh, I think all of it's a learned skill, right? When I was uh, born, I was the world's crappiest walker, and you know now I can you know. Now I'll walk three, four miles a day, you know, just for exercise. Um, so some of it was environment, right? I was in a military school that taught leadership from age 10 through effectively 22 when I graduated college. Um, and so I had a lot of leadership skills, I guess, and just being able to be articulate about thoughts. Um, but it really didn't happen until I really stepped into it in the manufacturing space, uh, just communicating things. Um, and... I think it's absolutely learnable. There's, there's a few habits that you need, know, you, you can change your mindset pretty quickly. Like maybe within three months to six months, you can have a completely different life with extremely little effort or work. Um, and you know, you, you know, the Grow circle podcast is a testament to that, right? A lot of people that come on when they, when they share, it's like, okay, well at some point in their life, something happened and it caused them to shift the way they did things. And you know, that's all, all walks of life, different times. So it's definitely a learned skill. Um, and it's easy to learn. So. Right, right. It's it. It takes out the thought that well, you know, some people are just born with it. You know, they've they've got these natural abilities that I just don't have. Can't do it. It's like no, these are skills that you can learn if you discipline yourself and and train yourself in it, and you're consistent. So it that is definitely the mindset you've got to have when starting business, real estate, whatever it is. And so I know you you touched on there just as you gave your overview. You know, currently you're just really working on securing the the real estate you do have and you know just being patient for the right deals that come along rather than just trying to do a lot uh, of volume per se uh, what is that what does that look like for you are you looking at investing uh, primarily in long-term buy and hold do you do any short-term fix and flip uh, what's kind of the main strategy on those two fronts so the first thing I'll say is I, I'm my strategy for everything is uh, predominantly long-term buy and hold as a burr guy. And uh, we started buying tons of properties and projects. And you know, if we go back historically two years ago, right, it's after COVID, they've given these relief funds, interest rates are super low. And, you know, I was listening to the OG Bigger Pockets podcast and they were like, just all the people, OG Bigger Pockets was like 2012, 2013. And so they were like everyone who had just made it through the financial crisis and they were interviewing people who didn't make it and those who did. And it was the fundamentals. So I actually went back and re-listened to those when COVID started and, and I've really stuck to those baseline experiences. And, uh, but mathematically, you know, if you read it and, you know, David Green says it in the, the Burr book, you know, historical lows for debt and long-term fixed or very long-term stretches of debt in the United States um, is just incredible to <clears throat> be able to, to buy and build wealth. And so at the time I was not as experienced as I am now. And I bought as much as I possibly could uncomfortably more than I should have because I knew based on the math, Hey, this opportunity will probably never happen again. I do not know what I'm doing, but I know enough of what I'm doing that I'm going to take a gamble. I'm going to make an asymmetric bet to the upside. And so we scaled. I think we're at like 300 doors now. Um, and we really need to, we are actually actively scaling back our portfolio because at the time it was, hey, buy everything. Now we're like, okay, you know, let's see what's performing well and what's not. Maybe mm -hmm. we'll, uh, maybe we'll let some of that go. Right. And um, so that's kind of where we're, we're going. I'm still long-term buy and hold. Um, we are doing a little bit of wholesaling. The purpose of the wholesaling is not to make money from wholesaling. The purpose of it is purely um, that is our lead gen for us to buy our own properties. Hmm. And if it's outside of our buy box, we just pass it on to other investors, right? At this point, we're kind of large. We want to go after um, small strip malls, small um, apartment complexes. Um, so if it's not that, then we pretty much pass it all, all through. Um, and then stabilizing. So that's kind of where we're at now. Um, and I can get more into the specifics if you want. Um, sure, sure. So yeah. And remind me, what, what markets are you in? Or is it one particular market? So I am in the Springfield, Missouri market. Um, and we are in the Buffalo, Missouri market as well, which we strategically are just choosing to get out of. 
Um, so we're just kind of slowly b- backing out. The reason why is uh, that's an outlying market to our town and our systems and processes and crew. Uh, it's just too far away for us to reach. And just kind of a, a, a gut call between me and the other partners that bought in that town where we either A, need to continue to scale and grow new systems and processes in that town, or B, we'll just kind of sell, reallocate funds. So mm-hmm. generally we don't sell or I don't sell personally. I don't advocate for selling. I'll do a cash out refis or I'll just hold indefinitely. Um, that one is a strategic, let's move out of that market and let's move back closer. And that's purely, you know, the numbers make sense. It's a good long-term hold. It's just, we weren't big enough in that area. And so it was very expensive anytime something went wrong. So we just yes. kind of chose to to scale back to closer to home for our normal systems and processes to reach. Absolutely. Yes. I, I wanted to ask about, you know, you've gotten up to about the 300 door mark, you said, but then even scaling that back a little bit. What's What's the decision making behind that? Is it primarily, well, hey, I just don't, we just don't really like these particular properties. You know, they don't really fit our long-term plans for what we want to hold on to. Is it the debt on those just happens to be higher? They're not really making money. They're more breaking even. And, you know, it's just best to get those off the books, save that money for another purchase. What's the decision-making uh, behind that? That's a, that's a great question. So the short answer is I don't really care what the market's doing. Mathematically, it makes sense to do all of the things. Um, it was more about a return on time and not a return on equity or return on investment. And what I mean by that is mathematically, it absolutely pencils out to like, uh, for instance, last year I sold, um, I think it was nine of my crack houses off. And those were just properties that I had not gotten around to. And mathematically it is superior. I should have gone ahead and flip the rest of those nine properties. Hmm. It always will pencil out. Uh, I have a million exit options. I have all of the things, but by that time I was already big enough and I was already doing, you know, a eight plex to 18 plex, you know, basically bigger than five, smaller than 20 Hmm. apartment complexes. Well, that's one roof to deal with. That's, you know, four water heaters to deal with, you know, and it's just, it's not a return on investment thing because mathematically it would have made sense. Were we a larger organization? Absolutely. We probably just would have kept them. But because it's, it was just me and four guys, we decided to say, hey, um, that's math-wise, that it's worth the money, but it's not worth our time. Let's go after some bigger fish, even though it's a smaller return, if you will. So yes. that was kind of the main one. And then that, that was the same line of thinking for uh, when we were getting out of the Buffalo, Missouri market. And we're still on our way out. We've, uh, we had two apartment complexes and a hotel. And we've sold two apartment complexes at this point, And then we've just got the hotel left. And it was the same thing. It was, hey, mathematically, it makes sense to keep them. But for our effort and time to manage them from afar, we either need to A, scale up over there or B, scale back and bring that money closer to where our, our systems and processes work. So, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And it seems like on that, at this point, like you're saying, you're just calculating out what is the best use of time and where should we put our attention on the investment. And that seems to be, like you said, larger than five units below 20, kind of that sweet spot there. For now, yeah. Uh, w- at what point did that make sense for you to transition into, hey, we just want to be making these purchases. Maybe we don't have to get as good a deal as we used to. We can just improve the value of the property through a rental increase and, and appreciation. So I can say a few things. The first one is the market's different. The market's wildly different. So <clears throat> back when money was cheap, people were selling garbage for anything and they'd have five offers and people would be bidding it immediately and getting it and blah, 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 blah. And I didn't really care what the market was doing then because uh, it, it's, I still don't care what the market's doing now because you, you're buying things that make sense, right? I'm not, I don't care that the rates went up or down. I'm thinking about that from a long-term strategy for cash out refinances, but it's more about forcing the appreciation. I'm going to buy someone's problem and headache. And when money's cheap, prices of properties are high. And so I had to buy a bigger problem back then. Um, And now money's extremely expensive, right? Commercial rates, which is all I operate in, is 8.99% right now, where, you know, you're standard Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac guy, they're, they're sitting at like, 
you know, six nine nine or you know seven twenty five or something, and and we're we're on longer, we're on shorter AMs, we're on like twenty to twenty five year AMs, so that really screws with uh, your your cash flow. But because all of commercial is in that same pain point, we get to solve a different problem. We put away the you know, hey, we could pretty much only buy distressed properties. Um, now we're looking at operational distress, and we're buying closer to turnkey properties. Uh, in this market, and we're getting a lot more seller finance deals. Uh, we're a lot of a lot of creative finance, right? We we are bringing those deals to them and saying, "Hey, why don't we elevate you to the bank? And you you know we'll pay you some down payment, and then we'll pay you X dollars for a long time." And actually, you know, because I understand that game too, that's how I sold my um, my portfolio of nine properties. I sold them to my contractor, allowed him to basically buy them for zero dollars. I carried a second against the properties and he, instead of spending the money on a down payment, he used them on renovations. So he's already turned four and he's positive two or three grand and he's only turned four out of the nine so far. So again, the money was there. I just didn't have the time to, to deal with them. Right. No, that makes, makes a lot of sense. And now is the time, like you're saying, with the cost of money, you've got to get creative and you've got to do some of these different strategies, like you said, buying seller finance, even for you selling that way and finding another method to get into these long-term buy and holds. Because if that's your goal, right, and you don't need to make all this money, it's just a matter of getting smart investments. And, you know, for, for you, you know, you're, you're more on the multifamily, you want to be on commercial side um, and you're able to just put more money down. That's uh, definitely a big advantage versus somebody that's getting in that's wanting to do the single family, you know, to start. So I think the short answer, I think I didn't answer a question you had asked earlier is when, when is the time to transition or why? Um, I, I'm going to say maybe a controversial thing. And of course I'm in the Midwest, right? So if you're in, I don't know, San, San Francisco or New York, then the, the math's going to be different. The fundamentals are going to be the same. The math's going to be different. By the time you've done like five crack houses, and I say that, you know, as a joke, but it's like, by the time you've gone into an 1890s or 1920s property five different times and fixed all of those issues and gotten the permits and upgraded all the electrical and done all the things, by the time you've done five of those really tough projects, you have enough experience to jump into anything at that point. Um, so at that point, it's going to be, what is your, are, are, are you and your wife doing it? and you guys are both working W2 jobs, that's gonna be a different answer for you. Me, I was full-time at the time. This is all we do all day, every day. So we scaled rapidly in two years, and now we kind of have our, have our, our pickings of that. Um, and, and, and kind of to answer what you were just asking about, you said, oh, you know, at this time in the market, you know, I, there is no bad time of the market to buy. It, there is no good time and bad time. People are all, you know, people who generally aren't investors are all freaked out. Um, when money was super cheap two years ago, oh my gosh, there's going to be a bubble. It's going to collapse. Don't buy now. Now things are super expensive. Oh, I can't buy now. It's too expensive. Mm -hmm. No, just analyze each property deal that by deal. It's a three-legged stool, right? There is no good or bad time. It's what is the property with current conditions? It's how, what's the price? What's the interest rate? And what's the time? It's a three-legged stool. If you know those three things, then you can play with it, especially when it comes to creative finance. Um, and you, can, you know, we've done a lot of creative finance deals um, recently, and it, it, it's better for the seller because the seller now gets to be the bank. They're making more. They're not getting uh, in trouble. And we, they can sell the property to us for more money. We can buy it for more, more money because they're giving us terms and uh, instead, of, instead of price. So we just kind of hit them with the ABC offer most yes. times. Yes. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. I know a lot of people have been talking about over the, well, a lot of commercial properties, office space, especially um, some retail is in an interesting spot where a lot of those businesses are going online or businesses in general, their employees are working from home. They don't need as much space. So there's a lot of vacancy in commercial buildings across the country compared to a few years ago. And a lot of those uh, the owners, they locked in really cheap rates in that 2020, 2021 time. And those three to five year notes are coming due, you know, in these next few years. 
do you see that as uh, a good opportunity? Do you think that that is going to yield some really good purchasing um, opportunities to get properties cheap and to get into that space when they can't refinance at an 8% rate when they were locked in at a three and a half, four percent Do you see that as a possibility? Do you think that'll affect the real estate prices at large? Yeah, I definitely see it as a major opportunity uh, coming down the pipe and so, and for multiple reasons. So one, the pain's there, it's already there. Um, all I try to do is provide value, provide value, provide value. Uh, one of the local banks that I use, they reached out to me, they, came, they called me Monday. Today's what, Wednesday? They called me Monday and they're like, hey, Hugh, we are going to foreclose on this property. Do you, how about I sell you the debt? I'll give you the money to buy the, to buy the debt with, hmm. and uh, you foreclose and then you get the equity. We're, we're going to sell you a 30 unit apartment complex for the cost of the debt that's left, uh, which was like uh, something like a million bucks. And it's probably worth, you know, two and a half to $3 million. So whoever that operator is probably is having a pain point. They can't pay the debt. Even the most conservative underwriters two, three years ago in the commercial space, when they were looking at debt, they probably wrote it up. Hey, even if insanely interest rates get to 6%, we're still fine. And here we are after interest rates have come down and we're still at like 9% interest rates. Of course, I uh, and, and you, because we're in the Midwest, we are really, I, we're loving the whole people working from home thing, people moving away, hybrid work model, because what it's doing is, uh, it's, it's the reverse of what happened in the 70s, right? In the 70s, they started going after manufacturing and hollowed out the whole Midwest. Everyone moved to the coasts to find better life. And um, now with remote work and COVID and all that stuff, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of happy. I mean, not, not happy to see it for economic side, but I'm, I'm happy to see more people coming back to the Midwest. So I don't really see the vacancy here uh, as bad, but yeah, you know, if you're in a Chicago, um, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, I, I know I'm, I'm actually tracking the whole office space thing really heavily. And a lot of people are buying the building and then getting permits to turn it into residential where they'll infill into apartment complexes. Well, now that you're solving a, a housing crisis, now you have different debt, right? If you can buy it and get the permits, now you got a Fannie Mae, you know, backed thirty-year loan, non-recourse debt. That's that's residential money right there, style debt, you know. And, and so someone might be able to go into a five or ten million dollar project, which again, that sounds crazy, right? You're probably used to hearing, you know, ten thousand dollar numbers. You know, uh, you know, I bought it for a hundred thousand. I, you know, I'm all in for X dollars. The larger you go, the easier it gets. And don't let commas scare you. It's easier to do bigger deals because there's less players. The players that are there are more sophisticated. There's a lot less competition. And usually um, people are want to see each other be successful because you never know in you know a month or two years if you're sitting across from the, the, the person at the table again. Yes, I, I've definitely seen that in... You can deal with you know the crack houses your your whole real estate career and and be buying these ten thousand dollar properties and just trying to to turn a bunch of those to make a profit and eventually fix some of those up. But you're de you're just dealing with a different asset. You're dealing with different people in these transactions. And but you're doing and so really for that one transaction that's you know say fifty thousand dollars, you could be doing what you're saying a five million dollar and there's a lot of ways less headache. It's professional people that they have done these same things. They've gone through uh, a lot of deals in real estate to get there. And now that they are here, they, they know exactly what they're about, what their offer is. You can negotiate clearly, you know the terms and it, it's just very laid out. Uh, so I agree that if you're gonna be doing this, you know, five houses, 10 houses, might as well move up to these larger types of properties. and. I know you, you had mentioned, you know, buy, buy in any market, you know, people get really hung up on good markets, bad markets. Uh, do you, would you say that there is still a level of preparation and notice you have to have of the market itself so that, Hey, I'm going to go and sell off some of these types of properties so that when there's opportunities in this commercial space, people's notes are coming up and they can't refinance because the bank won't lend to them. There's still got to be some sort of keeping in tune with where the market's at, setting yourself up with more cash to deploy or be more aggressive like you did earlier. Is, is there still some of that level that you've got to be aware of and watching the economy? 
Yeah, so that's going to come down to each individual investor. Uh, so me, I invest my own money and then I invest uh, two or three partners' money. They partner with me and I'm investing on their behalf um, as family members. And, um, and then I've actually thrown in with some partners. So each investor group um, has a different definition of what they want to feel sec secure with. Um, you know, so I have one, uh, one family member that I'm investing with their high net worth income earner now, but they are, you know, wanting a different income stream in case anything were to ever, ever happen to their job. And, um, just because the, the way the job market is now. And so they're going to be want, they're going to want to be more cautious versus me. You know, I don't have any kids. I'm buying extremely, um, asymmetric bets. I'm going to say I'm betting on going big based on some market factors. I'd say if you are, and we're in the, we're in the Midwest cash flow markets, you know, when you get into appreciation markets, like your San Francisco's, your Chicago's, your, you know, big cities, you know, that's a different game, but the, the underlying is the same. It's, can you play defense, right? Cash flows there to protect your defense mm -hmm. as the property appreciates. And maybe there's a pain point, right? Maybe it's, okay, I've got six properties now. It's taken me 10 years to do because I'm in San Diego. Okay. 10 years ago when I bought that property for 500,000, it's worth 1.2 now. I lost money all 10 years while not being able to, you know, rents are just now covering my, my note. Okay. When you sell it, you've got all of that, that, that leverage and money you can use it to pay down some of your other debt. So it's, it's really know the basic tools, which probably sounds way more complicated as we're talking about it. Cause we're talking about it at a high level. It, it's the, it's the basic metrics, right? Um, cash flow really, when I first got into this, especially in the Midwest, we were more of a cash flow market. Now I, I feel like we're an appreciation market. Um, you know, when I got into real estate investing, a three, two would be $180,000. That was the mean average price in Springfield, Missouri. It's now 240,000, a $240,000. It does not cash flow. So if I do a burr, I'm going to leave money in the deal just so I can have break even, um, and, and scale from there. So the, there's, there's some level of preparation. I'd say the best thing you can do is find a local real estate meetup in your local market or wherever you invest and see what the big players are doing there. Real estate investors are generally very, very open. Um, they want to see each other be successful. They're usually happy to give out any information they can except for their contractor. And uh, it's true. It's true. And, 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 and yeah, don't be afraid, you know, like you're don't, don't have analysis paralysis. Right. Now, I know that's been, it was huge for me getting started, Just, you know, a few years back was going to these investor meetups, getting connected with people. They're very willing to share information, contacts. It, yeah. Like you said, it took me a little while to get a contractor, but you know, that's for good reason. Uh, it's hard to find those guys that do a good job, but that that's really what's going to get you in the game. And, and it gives you a pulse on your local market because you can look things up online. You can get national statistics and news, but it really does come down to your local market what's happening, you know, cause we were just talking here, a lot of people moving to the Midwest, a lot of people coming into this area because they can work remote for these companies that are out of the big cities, but now they can live here where cost of living is cheaper. I mean, it is crazy how many apartment buildings are getting built, just built alone and the surrounding cities. So you've got to have a real understanding of your local market rather than just these national indicators. Those things are good to know, but like you're, like you're saying, just knowing specifically the people that you're going to be working with. I am curious, we're in an election year, you know, some big changes potentially to come, uh, you know, things happening with, you know, the dollar over the last few years continues to get uh, lessened in value. You know, I don't know if you follow just the stock market, cryptocurrency, things there kind of going up. Uh, do you have any bold predictions for just the economy at large? Do you pay attention to that much? Um, or are you just really looking at your deal by deal real estate? Uh, that's a great question. So I, yes, I pay attention. Um, I remember prior to the invasion of Ukraine from Russia, I was really, really watching that closely um, before it happened. And uh, that was like two years ago now. 
Um, but I remember at that time I was like, Hey team, we're having a meeting, right? We're cutting our morning meeting short. We're going to, we're going to strategize. I think Russia is going to invade Ukraine and that's going to cause a oil related crisis of some kind. And so we, and a logistic nightmare. So buy things now that are electronic based. And so we bought, we stocked up on like sledge locks. This is all before anything happened. Right. Mm. And we just bought all the things that we thought might be affected. Um, elections, you know, I'm not really, uh, I don't really pay attention to what well, anything that happens in your local election and your local market is far, far, far more impactful than what's going on at the national level. Um, so if you're going to pay attention to anything, pay attention to what's going on locally. Um, I've recently been getting really involved with the local government, voicing my opinion as a developer or a real estate person, a person in the community. And you know who shows up? Nobody shows up except for like, a few very disgruntled older people and like maybe two of me's or maybe three of me's. So you're having very few people influence, have the ear to the government, the local government that are making these decisions. And then you have the crazies that show up. And so the normal folks like us who are too busy hustling and doing a good job, we don't go to our local elections. We don't go figure out what's going on in the state level and we don't share our opinion. And then we're steamrolled or you know blindsided when something crazy happens from, uh, you know, some local policy. Some about Airbnbs, maybe right? We were, we were big on uh, Airbnb short-term rentals for a while, and uh, they passed a tax locally in town, and uh, we basically strategically decided that we're killing off our Airbnbs. Right? Had our entire business model been around that, and we weren't paying attention, it could have really affected us. Luckily, we were paying attention. Um, big predictions. Uh, I'm going to say, I think what's going to happen is rates are going to continue to go down as rates continue to go down, um, or even stabilize. If we get into like six and a half percent territory, we're going to see the market start to wake up. The market's already woken up, right? It was, I know it's seasonal, but it was super dead, um, last year, uh, especially like November, December, January, starting in February which is pretty early. People are moving. People are wanting to move into our properties. People are wanting to buy and sell things. Uh, we're seeing way more movement and that's a national level, right? Probably not the unique markets, right? Um, and I think that's just going to continue to happen for two reasons. Either A, interest rates are coming down or B, there's been an artificially suppressed demand market from the Fed created. And they had a lock in effect. So 75% of all mortgages were like a 6% or lower in the United States as, as of the beginning of this year. Well, as things trend closer to that six mark, we're going to see more people open up. Two, people are used to it, right? People were used to, oh, I had a 3% rate. And for the last two years now, it's been more like a seven and a half, seven, you know, eight percent rate. People are just getting used to that's the new number. And so now people are just opening up. So we're going to see, I think, supply is going to return, but the demand has never gone down. The demand has not gone down at all. Supply may, in turn, uh, may increase, which makes you think that real estate prices are going to go down. No, the demand is so high that I think we're going to uh, just have more inventory come on the market and it's already affecting things. So the appraisal is coming back right now as of February, are way, way different than the appraisals coming back for the same type of property uh, as November. And that's just been three months. Yes. I'm absolutely seeing the same thing that, of course, some seasonality, it's it's uh, holidays. But I mean, th there's such a stark difference, literally, from November, December to the beginning of the year. Like, really, we usually see a lot of people willing to sell, willing to buy, you know, come springtime, summertime, it's, it's picking up. It was like first of the year, things are going, people are moving. And I know there was that little rate drop towards right around turn of the year, which got people uh, back into it and excited. But yeah, I, I agree. If rates can continue to come down even just a little bit closer to that 6% mark uh, where more people have loans, you're going to see a lot more people willing to, to get back in the market. Demand is already there. It'll only increase. And then supply is, yeah, it's slowly catching up to get us back to normal levels. But for now, I mean, like you said, people are getting used to that new norm of the interest rates. So I think, uh, I do think it's going to be overall a good year. Um, 
but at the same point, you know, prices are still high and people are still going to be a little hesitant on that. Well, and when prices are high, um, that's when we're getting great deals. We're buying almost turnkey stuff. It's been a buyer's market for so long now that people have been hurting. Oh, you know, you know, people throwing up a three, two in the past, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's three forty, And by the end of the week, someone will have bought it for three fifty. or sorry, two forty. Now they're buying it for two fifty. Well, it's been going the opposite direction for a while. So as, so if you're creative, right. And, and agents don't like this real estate agents generally, um, from an investor standpoint are, are horrible. Um, you know, if you're not, if you're not an investor friendly agent, but a lot of the times it's like, I will buy your property for more than you are asking. If you can give me the terms, right. You want 250. How about I pay you $260,000? Let me give you 20 grand down now and I'll pay you a thousand bucks a month for 10 years or, or whatever the math ends up being. Right. That's probably not, not even close to correct, but that right there was like, Oh, a thousand bucks a month. And I get 20 grand in my pocket. Of course I'll do that. That sounds great. In a, you know, when money's high and we're the only person that's been taking them seriously, or they've had like three or four tire kickers and two deals fall through. And we're like, yeah, no, we execute, we close. That provides a lot of peace. Um, so you can buy awesome, awesome stuff now that you could not buy before. And, um, so yeah, uh, the short answer to your previous question is I still take everything deal by deal. I will always take everything deal by deal because it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. Only thing matters is closing right now on this property. Do the three legs of the stool make sense? Hmm. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I do want to jump into a little bit on the two second lean that okay. you know we mentioned in the beginning and that you have been big on. Uh, I find it to be a very fascinating and just an obvious really process for optimizing your business and would love for you to give a little maybe explanation, just an overview on what it is. Um, and then, you know, I'd like to talk about how you've seen it play out for yourself and others. Absolutely. So um, two second lean was created by a guy called Paul Akers in the lean world or the manufacturing world. I'm going to back this up to just, I'm going to give a little bit of a synopsis of the manufacturing world. Um, and manufacturing business owners will relate to this. I consider, and this is me saying it about me personally, generally manufacturing businesses are the mentally handicapped of the business world. And what I mean by that, it sounds like something mean to say, is that we are dumb and we are banking on taking like a million dollars of raw material and hopefully coordinating employees to want to have buy-in not have defects and turn that million dollars of raw material with labor, you know, so we were all 1.5 in into $1.6 million worth of finished goods. And then we're selling it as a commodity to some big middlemen like Walmart or, or whatever. And then they actually execute on it. And so we have all this work, all this churn um, for razor thin margins and companies that exist. And that's not even without, that's, that's without debt load. You throw debt load in there, it's super dangerous, right? Mm. So all of that to say, manufacturing is a very, very tough cutthroat competitive business. And it's not cutthroat from each other as manufacturers. It's cutthroat from like just market conditions and forces. So Lean Six Sigma was kind of like the one that was out there. And that is what was toted as a way to combat. It was created to help save manufacturers from these conditions and have some stability. And a guy by the name of Paul Akers took a look at that and said, well, lean is the science of subtraction. It's the uh, way to become easy and effective. And he applied the lean principles to Six Sigma and came up with two second lean. So it's a very easy way for a mom and pop, a solopreneur, a small entrepreneur, which is what we are as real estate investors, by the way, and implement ways to see waste and fix your systems and processes internally. Um, and it is hands down the reason why I was able to scale so quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, Lincoln and I were talking about this just before this. There are so many real estate investors. You know, if you're not in real estate yet, you're like, oh my gosh, there's, you know, like I'm a normal guy with below average intelligence. I got like a C going through school, you know, got a D for diploma in college and, uh, and, 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 but I'm consistently more successful than a lot of my peers. And a lot, a lot of that has to do with, it's absolutely the two second lean philosophy. It's, it's by guiding principle in, 
in ways. And we know, Lincoln and I know, a lot of real estate investors, or usually they're like a mom and pop or an old timer, that is so sloppy. They have no bookkeeping, no notes. They don't know what's going on in their property. And yet here they are like super millionaires because real estate is so forgiving of an industry. And so if you, you don't even have to be good at real estate. You just have to not be horrible. <laughs> if you're bad at real estate, you can be very wealthy. If you're decent at real estate, you can be you know, very, very wealthy. And if you're good at real estate, you can really, really do it with ease. And so um, not only do we scale quickly, we did it without tearing our hair out. We did that with a four-day work week. A hundred percent. It's it's why we are successful. And uh, and yeah, it's it's. I highly recommend anybody looking into it. Um. Yeah. Yes, I've I've def. You know, the way I heard you describe it is, in in a in a sentence is it's about developing people. Yes. And there's a lot of it that goes into just taking time to consider. Okay, how are we going to uh, specifically just grow the, grow the business, right? Sharing ideas, um, even sharing videos and content around this and just bringing the team into the, the actual things that are going to move the business forward rather than just the day to day and setting aside time for that. Is, is that kind of the synopsis of it? How does that actually play itself out on a day to day? Absolutely. So uh, the high level of it, and I actually came up with a better uh, analogy or heard a better analogy is, um, Everyone says they want a six pack, right? Everyone says they want to be in shape, but no one wants to dedicate the time to go to the gym. And when people get a six pack, pack nobody or no that no one that gets a six pack is surprised. They just spent the last six months working towards it, right? So two second lean is dedicating an hour of time, approximately every day with your team, to go to the gym. Except for this gym is training your minds. And, and developing, training and developing your people. You train and develop your people every day over long periods of time. They get really good at critical thinking and problem solving skills. Um, and I know people that are just being exposed to this, they're, they're like, oh my gosh, that sounds very intimidating. Nah, read the book. There, there's a few books out there. Very, very simple to implement. But it's just a habit. Every day we start our day at seven. From seven to 7.30, we do what's called 3S time. No one in my company is allowed to work. No one in any of my companies, I run 12 right now, is allowed to work. Instead, they're required to do something that makes their own job better, easier for them, not for me, easier for them. If they're the maintenance guy, they're reorganizing their tool drawer. Um, if they're a lawnmower guy, they're sharpening the blades on their you know mower or whatever. Um, if they're behind a computer, they're learning about their software or their coming up with a, a template because they've replied to the same email for the 15th time this week. Um, and then after that 30 minutes is up, we do a morning meeting and the morning meeting is just a time frame that we don't talk about work. It's not a stand up meeting. It's not about what we're going to do for the day. It we're there to train and develop ideas. And the people who lead that are the, are the team. So I don't, I do lead it, but that's because I'm in rotation. It rotates through everybody. In the company, um, they they present when they present. They're actually learning, um, and then when that's over, then we break apart into small groups and we actually pick what we're going to do for the day. And that's when that's the first time we talk about work. So out of a five day work week, we're taking seven hours out of the week from everyone in town, from everyone in the company, and we're dedicating that time to training and developing them. Everyone else would be like, "Oh my gosh, that sounds crazy. We have too much going on. We could never do that." Well. The reason you have no time in your company is because you're not taking the time to to pay attention. So that's that's really the that's the secret sauce. I really explained it as simply as I could, and if you just took that and did it with no other context, you'd be more successful than 99% of your peers. Oh, I believe it. I believe it cuz most business owners, people in the businesses are putting out fires, working on the day-to-day -day and just keeping up with whatever is there rather than really dialing down and figuring out how could we do this at a successful rate, utilize our time well, improve the processes. I mean, it gets, I like it because it gets all the employees, everyone excited about the business aspects, not just the to-dos, not just the tasks, but how is the business working and functioning? How can we improve this? It's going to make it easier on me as an individual and on all of us for our productivity. It brings everyone involved. Uh, I, I'm curious, is that, you know, our 15 hour, is that 
just a part of the normal eight hour workday that they'd have? Or are you bringing them in an hour early? No, it's just a part of the day. Whenever we start the day, that's what happens. Got it. Um, Got it. Every day when we start, that's the expectation. If you have shift work, like let's say you had a morning crew and afternoon crew, then at the beginning of their shift, that happens. Hmm. Um, so the continuity is there. Um, depending, like a, let's say it's restaurant style, bar style, their their employees are always on different shifts. So um, you try to rotate people through. Usually the morning meeting is the one. The morning crew is usually the largest. Um, but wh whatever your largest meeting is, try to get that direct time. Because there's like, I don't know, there's I've been a part of so many companies. I've been in so many companies. I've consulted with so many companies where people in departments next to each other don't even know each other's names. Like that's very common. Like, and so just getting everyone in the same space. So we're on the same team and making them, you know, understand like, Oh, before it was like, well, department a, they're always so, you know, whatever negative thing. And, you know, it always impacts me department B. And there was actually a communication barrier. Instead of saying, hey, actually, we're here to serve our customer. Department B is Department A's customer. Department A probably needs to work out better. Department B probably needs to learn why Department A does some things. Maybe there's some kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, rule they have to follow or law, or maybe there's a machine that's broken. And so without that communication, you just don't know. You're just frustrated. Yes. So Yeah. Yeah. That's... <laughs> it's definitely going to help fix the processes that are broken and get people talking, uh, which is huge. I know you've mentioned how this uh, has helped your businesses so much in rapid growth over the years. I mean, what are some of the successes uh, that you've seen others that you've shared this with, that you've just heard these stories of them implementing um, this strategy? Absolutely. So the, the first and foremost thing is freedom and time. So um, the best way I put this is there are so many good bakers out there but very few of them know how to run a bakery. And um, Two Second Lean is a framework that runs your bakery for you. And so I can go into any system. I never, know, I never need to know how to bake. I can go into anywhere and run a bakery very, very well. And that's just an example of most people are, like you said, they're running around, they're fighting fires, they're, they're in the day-to-day. -day. They don't own a business. They don't own an asset, they own a job. And if they stop doing it, them and their company implodes immediately. And that's why they can never take vacation. And this is connecting with, you know, some of your listeners right now where they're like, oh my gosh, I can't, I, I went, you know, with my wife somewhere on vacation and I got five calls and it was, and, and I needed to be on those calls. No, you don't have any systems and processes. You are working in your business and not on your business. And you need to get that out of not just your responsibility, but you need to make it the responsibility, not of a person, but of a system and process. Second lean is that for me. Um, when I teach companies how and, and people hire me to come in, I'll implement that. Um, one guy, uh, a few years back, they were out of Chicago. We implemented the system. So the people who ran the place were Russian. The people who worked in the back were Mexican and they had a Dutch guy in accounting. And everyone spoke broken English. And we and uh, I think we took them from six hundred thousand dollars a year, and we had a twenty percent out out uh, outlay. So that was like seven hundred forty four grand. So they they brought me in for a week, and we basically just cleaned up some of their processes, and they are now making seventy, you know, seven hundred forty four grand without hiring any staff, without buying new equipment, without doing anything. Uh, they actually saved a ton of money because a lot of that was just their scrap rate. Like the fact that they would go and manufacture stuff and they'd be throwing stuff away due to poor process. Then that poor process meant that they had to go and um, get more raw material and jump the line to fix defects. And, and it's really, really straightforward. Very simple. It's about, it's about simplification. It's about removing obstacles, not about creating more. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of many, many examples, you know? So, um, actually with, uh, with, uh, uh, Jacob Engledew, uh, right. he, uh, I remember when we first met, we had a conversation. It was five, five minute conversation at a real estate meetup. And we've factored in and figured out that if he just backs his pickup truck 
uh, up into the driveway, if his, if his text did, that he would make $41,000 more that year. And it was just because it was like 19 steps from, you know, the average driveway uh, from parking on the curb versus parking in the driveway was well, 19 steps one way, then it's 19 steps back, plus all the gear for the tech. And if they did that, they would, I think it was like one and a half more uh, jobs per day they could do. So the techs are doing less work, but able to get to more jobs. So without hiring anyone else, he was able to grow his portfolio with, you know, and so on and so forth. So like, that's, that's what two second lean does. That's a lean part. Two second lean trains your team to think like that. Not me. You don't want, I don't want to, you know, if someone hires me, I don't want to see them again. Uh, cause we did it wrong. If so, yes, it implements that way of thinking in their organization. Their job then is to keep the framework going. Yes. It, it's, it's a powerful, it's a powerful thing. And it's cool hearing those, you know, precise stories on, Hey, this is a direct results of just taking the time to get the theme, the team thinking about, uh, optimizing the, the processes and how can we do this in an efficient way and getting them on board with it and behind it uh, so that they're motivated there. And, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to as the business owner leader doing that consistently with your company day in and day out, not just occasionally, but like making this an actual thing that you do across the board. And, you know, it just takes persistence and discipline and getting that established. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, how important is it for you to be disciplined in other aspects of your life outside of business? And how do you think that discipline affects somebody's ability to work and improve their hustle within the company itself? Great question. I'm going to say maybe a controversial topic and we might be splitting hairs over a word you use. So you use the word discipline, which usually in the West is um, a negative thing. Like it's a hard thing to do. You got to be disciplined to do this and that. And oh, you got to have discipline. The military, you have to have discipline, right? Um, I'm going to say that discipline is very hard, but I don't, I'm, I don't do discipline. I do habits. Habits are very easy. So when it's just a part of your routine, just stick to the routine. You wake up and, and you can, you know, we, you can call that discipline if you want. But in the morning, I have a routine. I wake up at 530. You know, from 5.30 to 6 is my wake-up time-ish, brush your teeth, whatever. From 6 to 7, I grab coffee. I go for a walk with my wife and the dogs. And then from 7 to 7.30, I journal, right? Uh, or now I do anyways. We've modified our morning meeting schedule. Then when we go to actual work, then we have a morning routine. It's very calm because everyone in the company knows what we're doing every morning. And by the end of that hour, right from which is now 7.30 to 8.30, everyone then starts the day. It's not crazy. And I guess it's, yes, you need to have the discipline to stick to say, yeah, oh, I have to make sure I make that meeting every day. No, no, no. A company requirement is the meeting happens from 7.30 to 8.30 and everyone's going to go there and no work is to be scheduled before then because that's what we're going to be doing. It's very freeing because people know exactly what to do. So that's in the work side. And in my personal side, if, if there is something there, instead of thinking about discipline, I have to remember to go work out. I have to force myself to work out. Just say, no, I work out at uh, you know 4 p.m. on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's when I work out. Right. Yes, there's discipline involved in forcing us to go. But if you can just get in a routine, there's that. And actually, I got that from Paul Akers. I think his mom's like, a hundred or 101, so, something crazy. And, and the discipline question was asked to her and she's like, ah, no, I'm, I just have the same routine every day. The routine happened to be good, full of good habits. So if you're in a routine of bad habits, then it probably takes a lot to break that, right? I'm, I don't have a routine. It's whatever I want. And so if it's, I take discipline to force myself to go to, um, to the gym or whatever it is, right? Or just say, oh yeah, Tuesdays at this time I go. So controversial, maybe we're just hit, splitting the hair on the topic, but it's really, it's, it's way more simple to just put a very simple routine. You're going to make mistakes. You're not going to get it right. We're human. Just do it and then fix it along the way. But too many people try to d design stuff and it never works. So just don't worry about being disciplined. Just get in a, a good routine. Like I don't even like the word habit because habit still sounds a little negative. Routine. Just like, ah, it's what I do at this time. It's 9 a.m. I do this thing, right? Right.
Right. Yep. You're like, this is important. We're going to set it here. And yeah, this is just part of the day. It's expected. And you just, you roll into, it. I think that mindset and the verbiage that you use is very important. And especially when you're getting started. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I'm actually going to say that one more time and I'll, I'll, I'll be a little bit more harsh and direct with the words. I am intentionally weaponizing me being lazy. Remember, I'm a, I'm a very lazy uh, average guy of average intelligence that is often very successful. I just made a routine and that routine has successful habits in it. And I pretty much try to stick to the routine. I'm not, oh, Alex Ramosi, and we're going to do these things. And, and, and if, you know, no, it's, I have a routine. I kind of identify what I want to do. I then say, okay, here are the habits that I want to happen in order to get to that goal. So I'll try to make a routine to do that. Like this morning, I missed my routine because I woke up late. No big deal. It, I, you know, I woke up about seven. So I just picked up my routine where it was or I modified. It, so. Right. Roll with it. I, I wanted to ask uh, as we, you know, enter into the, the ending here. Um, but before that, like, what, what's the content that you put out? I know that you're working on some things on your end and, you know, you've got an audience that has followed you and, and a lot of what we're talking about. W what is your content and uh, what are you working on right now? So that's a great question. It's kind of been all over the place for the last two years, but I really haven't solidified now. So I have two very different things. Um, the first one is real estate finance business. Uh, I have a, um, I have a, a brand called hughcarnahan.com. Uh, that's where you can find more info about me, but basically it's small business rescue or small biz rescue. And what was happening was I was giving a lot of my time away for free and helping a lot of business owners and, uh, people would hire me to consult, right? I'm not a consultant by nature, but I'm a business owner that will consult. And, um, and then people kept asking the same questions. Everyone asks the same questions all the time. And so I kind of created small biz rescue. Um, to be a two-second lean improvement to answer a lot of those questions before they ever come to me. Um, and then the second one is about homesteading. I have a homesteading channel called Hillbilly Millionaire Homestead. And I applied two-second lean principles to gardening and uh, animal husbandry. So it's lazy, no effort work um, to grow lots of food and be self-sufficient and uh, fun stuff like that. But all, all of it's rooted in two-second lean. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Applying it in other areas outside of, of business, like you're saying, and, and it works. It's, it seems like that's the strategy there. Yeah. yeah. Once you see it, um, if, if, you know, you, you have a lot of real estate listeners here, it's like you're building a house with screws and the only tool you have is a tool, you know, is a screwdriver. Two second lean is like, if I taught you what an impact driver was, you still have all the knowledge of the way the house goes together, the way the thing goes together. I'm just giving you a better tool that you can choose to use or choose not to use, right? You probably don't want to use an impact driver when building a computer, but you, you know, and so on and so forth. Two second lean is just a tool that can be used on top of anything you do already, good or bad. And uh, it doesn't change what you're doing. It just changes how you approach and tackle problems. So it's, it's an incredible thing. You can find out more about it on hughcarnahan.com or Small Biz Rescue. Yes. Yeah, definitely check that out. I'm, I'm going to be taking a look. And I want to ask you a few questions that I Let's ask each, each person that comes on here. I'll fire them off to you. Uh, first one here, what is one of the best pieces of advice that you have been given? Take action and get started right now. Take imperfect action right now. Mm. That's it. It's too many people that I know are in analysis paralysis. Um, you know, they, they may, you're, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably on a successful track and you have friends that aren't listening to these things and you're, you're trying to drag them along. Don't worry. Just be the example. Just get started. Take imperfect action. Don't let analysis paralysis slow you down. Um, I fail 30 to 40 times per day. I try something new. It fails. But I took an action. I took a step. Now I course correct. That didn't work. Okay. Correct it. Take another action. That failed, but it failed a different way. So it's, we're talking about micro iterations. Um, and that's what Two Second Lean does. It teaches everybody to take actions. You're actually re required to every day. Part of your job is you, you come up with an idea, you implement the idea, you film it, you share it with a group. Maybe a good idea, maybe a bad idea. It doesn't matter. You tried something. If you're not failing, you're not trying. So just take action. 
for sure. Like that's hands down. Um, not saying take massive action, not saying, uh, burn the boats and, you know, uh, jump into real estate head first. Just like, Hey, make an offer, right? You made an offer to call, call a contractor, right? Call someone, you know, just, just take imperfect action. You're not going to get it right, but you're going to find out way more getting it wrong than you will planning anything. I, I, I don't plan anything. I just do. You're just doing it. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people know, they, they know that next step that they need to take. It's, it's on their mind. They've, they've been just pushing it off. They've been, like you said, overanalyzing it. Just take that action and, and be moving forward. I think that you're right on there. And, and if you go back to a lot of the, the podcasts, that, you know, guests that you've had on the Growth Circle podcast, at some point, those folks took action, right? When it was a spiritual growth, when it was, you know, real estate growth, business, whatever it was, they took action, right? And, and, and the successful ones and the ones that you're probably interviewing now take action more consistently than the ones that didn't. And, and they get it wrong a lot. I get my stuff wrong every day. I try to get stuff wrong because it means I tried something. If I'm not getting stuff wrong, it means, that, it means I stopped trying. So that's not, we don't allow that in my company. Yes. Yes. Well, second thing I want to ask you here, what is one of your favorite or maybe currently favorite business books? Ooh, I, you know, I, in the past I've said uh, two second lean, which I still highly recommend that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and go with the new ones are going to be hundred million dollar deals and a hundred million dollar leads by Alex Hermosi. And he's, I think he's coming out with a hundred million dollar um, sales or persuasion coming out. So um, at some point I like those cause I am fundamentally not a salesperson and it, it teaches me to interact um, and, and reassess the way I provide value to people um, and communicate that value. Um, and so, yeah, I like it. Yeah. Uh, those are definitely on my list. I like Alex's uh, content. I mean, hugely uh, impactful and yeah, a lot of wisdom there. So definitely, yeah, take a look at those books. Uh, the third thing here is what is one character trait you notice that successful people commonly share? Ooh, this is a good one. I'm going to either say it's A, well, we just said it earlier, take action. Um, but there's a lot of successful people that are still analysis paralysis type. I'm gonna say they're always very well read, um, successful people. And, and this is a new habit for me, right? 2019 and before I was just like a normal guy. Didn't listen to books, didn't listen to podcasts. Uh, now it's all I listen to. Um, so, and it, it could be interesting, like I'm listening to like a woodworking podcast and a podcast on survival and pod, podcast on uh, real estate and then bigger pockets and money and, you know, listen to, uh, the growth circle podcast and, it really comes down to successful people generally are listening and growing themselves or their knowledge base to some degree, right? If you're a mechanic, then listen to mechanic stuff, you know, yeah, you know or like maybe you're a bad mechanic, right? You're a good mechanic. You're bad at running a, a maintenance shop, an auto body shop. Then maybe you should be listening to the business books, how to run a good business, right? So it's just successful people are generally very well read and they're constantly learning something. So I like that. I like that. It's always improving, not, never staying stagnant. And that's right, the name of the podcast, the Growth Circle Podcast. If we're in a growth mindset and we are putting things in front of ourselves to continue to learn and educate, th then we are going to improve ourselves, find new business, surpass you know, competition, people that aren't. And you know, that's how you separate yourself out. I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to challenge that a little bit. Um, and it's directly from Alex Ramosi's $100 million offers book. The market is continuously expanding and growing at whatever the G GDP is, whatever, 9%. Inflation's going at 9%. Just to maintain where you're at, you need to be growing. To actually grow, you need to outpace pace inflation. So that's how people get left behind is they're not changing. They're not growing. And that's how you, I, other people are coming in and buying these businesses from mom and pops is they put everything on autopilot back in 1988 when they thought they had it all figured out, when everything that they knew was cutting edge. And now they're unwilling, not that they can't change, they're unwilling to change and relearn. So um, the Growth Circle podcast, uh, in order to grow, you got to push yourself even beyond that, which your listeners absolutely do. No, I, I think you're hundred percent right. There's, there's kind of a new baseline that you've got to, sur you know, surpass. And like you said, it just comes down to routines and putting those right things in place, but you've got to, you've really got to think about that now, maybe differently than you used to. Uh, 
So that's good. The last thing here is simply, uh, where can people connect with you? HughCarnahan.com. And I have a YouTube channel called Hugh Carnahan. So you can find me there if you want to find the small biz rescue stuff. I've got a podcast as well, two. One's called Small Biz Rescue and one's called FU Money, which is uh, just all things money. And the other one's all things business related. Very nice. Very nice. Well, Hugh, good talking to you, man. Uh, good hashing it out. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited and uh, I'm happy to hop on anytime. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, if you guys found value from this, definitely give it a like and a review. Um, his other episodes, like I mentioned earlier, were episode 43, 26, 22. So check those out. Um, also great in diving in deep on real estate business uh, and two second lean, all of it. So I will catch you on the next one. Thank you for tuning in. And see you guys. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks.